So hi everyone, welcome to part 14 of Organ Technology. We're still working on the 33E project, and this is kind of an adjunct to that. Last time we talked uh, about amplifiers and a little bit, and I showed some drawings of how a Class A amplifier worked, and a viewer wrote in with a question that we'll address at the end of this video. We're also going to take a look at, I did some shooting while I was putting the amplifier back into the Leslie speaker that goes with the 33E, and I did some shots of that. But first, let's uh, take a look at this. On my YouTube channel, you will find a variety of video products, including my arts and entertainment video podcast, Other Stages. Other Stages features music, stories, and thoughtful conversations with guests from across the entertainment spectrum. Also on YouTube, you will find my music videos that feature my original work and the classical repertoire. The Organ Technology series explores the fascinating ways in which organs have been built through history. You can sponsor my YouTube channel by joining me on Patreon, where you will receive exclusive Patreon-only content as a thank you for your support. You can also support my work at Venmo and PayPal, and you will always find these links in the video descriptions. My YouTube channel is not monetized and does not receive any financial support from advertisers. So just like PBS, I rely on people like you. Thanks. So hi everyone, welcome to Organ Technology, and uh, we're back working on the 33E designed in 1967 this one was built in 1971 and uh, while I was playing this uh, organ I finally got it set up and mostly playing and so I wanted to sit down and make some music on it and uh, one of the magnets on the pedal board fell off on a very critical note low D I mean you know you use low D a lot so at any rate um, this is a system that was used by Rogers and many other uh, organ makers in which you have a magnet on the end of each of the pedals and then inside the console there's a board that has a series of reed switches and um, that's a very nifty system because the pedal board easily comes out when you need to move the organ around. Um, in this case, we have these metal magnets, and they're glued onto the end of the pedal with some kind of epoxy. Now, later down the road, Rogers started using uh, rubberized magnets, the, the kind you uh, you know stick things on your refrigerator with, and those could be set on the pedal and then stapled into place, and that was a much more secure way. Of doing this. In this case we've got layers of epoxy where the magnets have been glued onto the ends of the pedal and re-glued onto the ends of the pedal and probably re-glued onto the ends of the pedal. Uh, most of these seem to be very secure. I don't see anything where I gently test it and it looks like it's getting ready to give up. But I don't think, I don't know exactly what kind of epoxy this is or if it's really epoxy. I really think my best bet for reattaching this is going to be with some contact cement. So we're going to try that out. Uh, the other thing we're going to do in today's uh, episode is we're going to get back into the Leslie speaker and we're going to put the amplifier back in and I'll explain what all went on there and why uh, when we get to that part. But right now, let's see if we can get this pedal magnet glued back in place. So I'm sure most of you have worked with contact cement before, you know, you, you get a good dollop of it on both pieces and then you wait for it to pretty much dry, you know, in two, three minutes, maybe even five or ten. And it bonds, it, it creates a, a nice solid surface bond on each of your pieces. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, bonds, of course, to itself. It's kind of like when you get um, uh, well, lift tickets at ski resorts used to be this way, where it was a piece of sticky paper, and then you would peel it off and fold it in half around the clip on the um, on your belt there. So you can see you had your lift ticket. I don't know if they do that anymore. So now we just got to wait for the contact cement to set up and then we'll put it down and see what happens. Okay, it's been a few minutes and uh, this seems to be just a little bit tacky. And yeah, that's good. All right, so. Now, of course, the thing about contact cement, right? You got to get it right in the right place the first time, or you got a mess. And that seems to be good. Seems to be holding nice and firm. And uh, once we get the organ back together and put this back in, we'll see how well our contact cement repair holds up over time. Okay, so here we are at the back side of our Leslie speaker which runs the tibia channel on the 33E. So we can kind of take a look at what goes on here. Um, this is the cable that comes from the console and it carries the 110 power to light this all up. It also carries the relay switching to switch this from high speed to low speed, back and forth, and it carries the audio signal. And that's why I originally thought, let's not have an amplifier right in the Leslie. Um, let's have the crown amplifier go ahead and power the speaker, continue to have this cable for the, uh, the rotating the motor part of it. Well, there's one channel out on, on that crown amplifier. You know, it's a thing I picked up in, in trade when I redid a sound system at a church. And so, you know, all right, you, know, you take what you get, right? Um, so at any rate, uh, we're going to try to just go set it back up in its uh, traditional setup. Now, the modifications uh, that I've made, I showed you what I did to the amplifier for the, uh, the output capacitor. I put in a newer capacitor there instead of that uh, cardboard tube capacitor. And uh, I've added a tweeter, a JBL little bullet type tweeter, the same that's on my uh, so-called uh, uh, M7 speakers. And there's a crossover and a uh, control right here. You just want a hint of that tweeter in here just so that it sounds a little more airy and, and natural. The other thing I want, because I am who I am and I like to make modifications, I want reverb. So we're going to use this reverb unit, which means I have to have one of my, I call myself the king of adapter cables. I've got an adapter to go from the uh, output that goes to the amplifier and I have to carry the relay signal through there as well. So we've got that and that goes here and then I have the quarter inch in and out to go on the reverb unit. We have the power supply for the little reverb unit and I've put in a multi-plug um, unit so that I can have both the amplifier and this little power supply uh, working together. And so now we've got to put this all together in some meaningful way. So first, let's hook up the speakers. Um, there it is. So all I'm doing is running the, uh, the tweeter and the main speaker uh, in, in parallel with each other. Uh, the amplifier can take 4 ohms. They're both 8 ohm speakers. Uh, and so that works just fine. Uh, there's no real uh, designation as to which side of the speaker is positive and which side is negative. Um, and it kind of, in, in this kind of application, doesn't much matter. Um, when you have 
more elaborate uh, crossover systems, uh, then you can run into situations where uh, the polarity of the speaker matters. Not so much because the speaker itself cares, uh, but your crossover network, depending on how it's engineered, uh, it can care quite a bit. <laughs> so, in this case, the crossover is nothing more than a bipolar capacitor, so connected to a rheostat and all of those things, they, they don't really give a crap. So, we can kind of just hook this up and it'll be just fine. So I'm still working on research for that um, uh, speaker uh, episode that's been requested and uh, I definitely want to do that because that sounds like a fascinating thing that we can get into. Um, speakers on these old systems were, were much more critical than sometimes we think and uh, that goes clear back especially to like Hammond and early, the earliest electronic organs. Um, how you set up the speaker system was, well the type of speaker you used was really critical and they had a lot of fascinating ways of doing things. Okay, so we'll get to that. So now our adapter for our little reverb unit, we're just going to stuff the reverb unit kind of back in here any kind of way we can. So. I do want this to be fairly neat and tidy. So normally this would just go right into the amp and then the 110 comes in, the relay signal goes out, turns the amp on, the audio signal is also going through here, then the speaker output goes back into the relay box and then out through here uh, to connect to there. Um, so I, you know, figure out how we can set this up nice and neat. So we got to get our adapter cord in here. This is the two. Here's our from. And then here's our power. And then let's see how we can kind of maybe get this stuffed back in here in some way that is going to be okay. I think if we let's see, get this this way, there we go. That's all right. And we can kind of run this around here on the back side of our little relay box. There we go. And then this can come around to the amp. say what I, I don't like about using this old style setup is that uh, well you've got the audio signal going through a cable that's also carrying 110 volts so I'm not sure how that's gonna you know that can be problematic and I remember back in the 70s when I was Still a kid and hanging out in organ stores and helping out, and we frequently had trouble with stuff. So, plus, you know, who knows uh, what's going to happen with my new capacitor. So anyway, let's. I've got some glory. Let's turn it on and see what happens. And something's banging in there somehow.
work okay, except that our reverb unit is uh, kind of overpowering the dry signal. Let's get this back out here. Let's see. Maybe a little less heavy. Alright, let's try that. <laughs> have a little distortion too. That might be on the back of the organ. We have to make some adjustments there. We can also take a look at this tweeter. And you can hear, I hope, kind of If you give it too much tweeter, especially on older organs where the speaker was really part of the filtering of the voice. Want well, just a hint. That seems about right. fast as it should. Let's see if I've got something else in the way there. That should really be about twice that fast. It'd be a proper proper tremolo. speaker running like it should. So we're starting to get a theater organ coming back together here. So um, this is promising to be very fun to play with. Uh, We'll see how this all holds up over time. The next thing I kind of have to do, this um, exponential horn speaker that's on the brass side, uh, when you set it on its tail like that, the uh, plugs that hold the speaker wires get pressed and then the speaker wires come loose. So i got to fix that. That's i got to put a, like a block on it or something, some kind of feet to, to clear that. Um, there's other things that are kind of behaving quirky. Uh, such as the percussion sounds and uh, the channel seem to be kind of phasing in and out and like I talked about before uh, bypassing that accessory panel because that's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not going to be using 
and why invite one more problem on a 50 year old item so we're gonna that involves taking the plug out of the output panel and then putting in jumper wires so that the signal comes from the expression module and then goes straight out uh, into the uh, output module and there we go um, the volume pots on the uh, output panel are dirty and scratchy and the problem with that is of course you get you get your volume adjusted just right and then well there's a little piece of dirt just sitting there and the next time you turn it on it's interfering and then and, and you got another problem but hey we got the Leslie back running uh, we don't have any unwanted noise issues everything seems to be coming together very nicely so at this point pretty much everything on the 33e is basically working there's still some wonkiness in the percussion circuits and I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do with that. There's really not much more I'm going to do with the 33E for now, except just enjoy it a little bit now that it's uh, all up and running. Now, last time on episode 13, when we were talking about amplifiers, I sort of casually mentioned, and I meant it to just be an anecdote, a little side note, that a lot of audiophile types believe that the type A amp or class A amplifier is really the best of the transistor amplifiers and a viewer wrote in saying hey should i have kept all of my old rogers class a amplifiers and not uh, substituted a class d amplifier for that amplifiers all come down to the engineering involved and what amplifier goes with what situation really depends on the circumstances of that situation one of the reasons I really dig the Rogers S100 amplifiers is that they're super rugged and robust and I can put them to the test and they hold up. I've used them in a variety of situations. Now, if the viewer had been putting a, an older Rogers organ in a large room, a kind of a professional environment, I would have said for sure, uh, keep those S100 amplifiers. But in this case, like me, uh, he's using the organ in his living room. It's really not going to put those uh, S100 amplifiers to the test. And really, a more efficient amplifier, like a multi-channel Class D amplifier, is probably a better choice for that circumstance, uh, to tell you the truth. And quite frankly, on all new Rogers installations, we're using uh, Crown 8-channel Class D amplifiers on, on all of our new work and they sound great. Um, I have a variety of amplifiers here in my studio and in the organ room uh, that I use uh, depending on the circumstances. Right here is where I do recording and uh, to monitor recordings when I'm doing multi-tracking and mixing and stuff, I have a top of the line all tube amplifier. It sounds amazing. Out in the organ room, I have a pair of S100s on the big Johannes organ. And, but over on the 33E, I'm using a Crown 4-channel AB class amplifier. And I'm also using one of the old Rogers amplifiers, as you saw, on the Leslie speaker. And that all works just fine for that. I have another kind of middle-of-the-road a uh, class AB amplifier that I use in my living room for, you know, watching TV and movies. Um, you know, it really comes down to this. A quality amplifier is a good thing. You know, if you buy a top quality amplifier, regardless of class, it's going to perform well. When we start getting into the things that uh, really picky people when they're listening to recording recorded music are, are into, yeah, there's certain things I like to hear when I'm listening to recorded music. And, uh, you know, if I'm being really nitpicky, yeah, I really like my tube amp for that. Uh, but the truth is, if I were to do a side-by-side -side test uh, with my tube amp and my S100 amps, I would have a hard time telling the difference. Uh, and, of course what kind of speakers you connect up to, uh, the quality of your input circuits, all of that is going to have a huge impact on whether or not the amplifier performs really well. 
in most home situations, if you're like me and, and, and you're playing around with these old organs as kind of a hobby, you know, find an amplifier that works. Uh, that's kind of your main thing. Uh, some stuff you do have to stick to very specific amplifiers, and we'll get into this when we start talking about speakers, uh, which is coming up in another couple of weeks. I'm going to start doing some episodes about different organ speakers. And we'll get into some of the specialty amplifiers and specialty speakers that went along with that. Um, I have to do a little more research to fully understand it, but one of the more interesting things is the, the subwoofer on Leslie speakers, um, like the 147 and, and the, the really classic Leslie speakers that went along with the Hammond B3s. Um, it was a dual coil thing that operated in a push-pull mode and so the amplifier had to operate in a push-pull mode and so that was uh, that's a situation where yeah you can't just substitute any old amp for that uh, but there was a lot of stuff like that and in the early early days of electronic organs both the speaker and the amplifier had to be engineered right alongside the tone generating circuits there's a certain amount of that with the 33E that we're seeing, but uh, when we get later on, of course, into digital organs, then it's completely the opposite thing. we got to have the, the most hi-fi speakers and amplifiers we can get our hands on to make the digital organs sound right. So it's a whole fascinating, fascinating world. So... Yeah, if you're in the market for uh, amplifiers, find yourself a quality amplifier, and uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the class. If you want to know more about how different classes of amplifiers work, uh, there's a number of great videos on YouTube that you know will take you right through the whole thing. You know, here's how class A works, here's how class A B works, and so forth, and you can find out what the differences are. But uh, Thanks for joining me. Next time I see you, we're going to be talking about speakers, and we'll see you then. Take care.